All right, so first, uncertainty in measurement. Now, this is something that's going to be important for every lab that we do, and every lab that you do in any future science or science-related class or even career in the future, and that is how do you take proper scientific measurements with the proper amount of uncertainty? And we mentioned this a little bit on Monday with the pretest, but um, specifically, we want to know that in each measurement, there are certain digits and uncertain digits. That means whenever you take a measurement, you have a certain number of numbers that you're sure about, and then you'll always have one number that you're unsure about. And so if you have some number, the uncertain one, some measurement, the uncertain digit is always going to be the rightmost number. So if you take a measurement of 6.21, the 1 is uncertain. If it's 6.210, the 0 is uncertain. So that's a much more precise measurement than, than 6.21. To practice that a little bit, since I know you've done this before, let's look at these three examples. And it might be a little hard to see. I'm just going to turn the lights down for this part so you can see it well. On the left, we have maybe a graduated cylinder with a certain amount of liquid in there. So if you were to write down the correct uh, measurement for that, what would it be? What would the number be? Let's call that milliliters. Let's say that's a graduated cylinder and we're measuring milliliters. How, what's, the pr what's the correct way to report that with all certain digits and one uncertain digit? What does that mean? What do you think? Yeah. 74.0. OK. Uh, anybody else? 73.5. 73.5. Mm -hmm. 73.50. So let's write some of these down and then talk about <laughs> what seems most reasonable. Uh, so we had 75.0, 74.5, 73.50. Anybody else? 73.9. Is that right, by the way? Did I? Those are ones that were said, right? 73.5. Oh, it was 74 and then 73. Okay. Let me change that. So that's the same thing. Okay. Anybody else have other things? Just 73? Okay. All right, so let's look at these. What, so first, what's the first digit that we can be totally certain of? The 7. Why? Yeah, it's clearly between 70 and 80. So we're definitely sure that the first number is going to be 7. All right. So that's a certain digit. We'll put that one down here. And then the next certain digit kind of depends on how you read this. So first, I guess we should talk about how you read this measurement. Um, and for those of you who don't remember or haven't heard this, you go from the bottom most point of that um, liquid's curve. So we'll say right there. So what's the next digit that we can be pretty sure of? Three. Probably a 3, right? I mean, where I drew that line is a little bit low. But you can see that this definitely is not smaller than the third line here. So it's definitely going to be something above 3. But also, I think we can say that it's below the 4. If that's the point that we're going from, we can say it's below 74. So it's in between 73 and 74, which means that we can be fairly certain, or certain, I guess, that the second number is a 3. All right. What's the next uh, digit that we can be certain about? None. Yeah, we can't really be certain about the next digit. Why not? Because you don't know if it's at 0.5 or 0.25 or... Right. We're limited by the gradations of the, measure of the instrument. Right? Anything that has... A, anytime there's a line, you can be sure that it's above or below the line because you can see the line and you can see whether it's above or below. So that becomes certain. But if there's no longer a line there that separates these things out, suddenly you're guessing. And that's fine. 
So we report the two numbers that we're sure of, and then we report the next number, which is a guess. So we know it's somewhere between 73 and 74. Where that is is going to be based on your estimation of what you're looking at. So looking at the very bottom of this, where I drew this line, I'm, I'm saying it's, it's just above this line. So I might say something like 73.2. Well, we can't say 25 because that's a now if we said 25, that would tell us that the point 2 is certain and then the 5 is uncertain. All right, so we have to we can only give one more digit. But you know, if you said 73.5 or 73.0 or 73.4, those are all roughly you know, fine because it's an estimate. And in general then, any measurement that you make is going to be plus or minus that one on the last digit. Which means that what we're really saying when we say 73.2 is that this is somewhere between 73.1 and 73.3. And I think that's a reasonable estimate for this, this measurement here, right? We know it's probably not all the way up. Assuming we're taking it from that blue line, it's probably not all the way up at 73 and a half. Um, Although that would also be a reasonable guess. We know it's not below that. So, so that's really what we're saying. All right. OK, let's try it again with the next one. So this time, uh, give it a little thought and think about what you might say for that one. This is going to be a temperature now. So we're going to look at where this line ends right there. All right. So. Got some 88s, 88.2, 88 point something. So 88 is certain. Yeah, let's, so is 88 certain? Yes. Yes, because we've got definitely above 80, so the 8 is certain. First 8 is certain. And it's definitely between 88 and 89, so that second 8 is certain. And then the last one's going to be a guess. So that guess is just going to depend on where you see that little line. And I think, yeah, something like 0 0.2, 0 0.3, right, something in that range. Some people say 88.3. And when we report that measurement, that tells us that's, eight, that's between 88.2 and 88.4. All right, one more time. This is a, a larger graduated cylinder now, um, C. Can you guys all see that OK? I'll just draw this little line here just to make it clear that's about where it is. How are you going to report that one? OK, so the 600 is, is certain. It's above 600, but below 7. It seems to be between the 4 and the 5th, 4th and the 5th grade here, right? Yeah, so 640 something, depending on how you. I think it's a little lower, actually. I think it's close. You guys probably can't see it as well back there. But yes, you know, something like 645, 644. Again, the last one is an estimate. So it's a judgment call on your part. Um, of, of where you think that is. There's, are there any discussions on B and C, or is it only A because it's a graduated cylinder? Like, what do you mean? Like plus or minus 0 0.1? Oh, that's, that's going to be the case with any measurement that we oh. make. Any, uh, sorry, yeah. A any measurement is basically assumed that the last digit has, has, about point, has about one degree of uncertainty, meaning you go plus or minus one in that last digit. I shouldn't have really written that. Um, because that, that has a statistical meaning that isn't really reflected here. Um, for those of you who know some statistics, the plus or minus comes from some calculations with standard deviation and stuff like that. But when we take a scientific measurement, what we're saying is that, that it's in a range of about plus or minus one from wherever that measurement is that we take it, All right, that we took. OK, questions about how to do that? So that's something you definitely want to make sure to be able to do, um, both from a paper standpoint. I'll, I'll sometimes talk about paper chemistry. I don't mean the chemistry of making paper. I mean the chemistry that we do on paper as opposed to lab chemistry. And this is something that is very important in both areas, that you should be able to do this sort of thing for an exam, but also you, you need to be able to do this in the lab. This also shows, and this is something I didn't really understand until I started doing this in chemistry, why significant figures are so important. I always, uh, initially, maybe you did too, I don't know, maybe not. I always thought of significant figures as just kind of an exercise, like something you had to do, and you had to count the, the things, and then you had to get some in. But it has a real physical meaning. What this is saying is, we cannot be more, um, 
exact in our measurement or more correct in our measurement than three digits, three significant figures. Which means when we do all kinds of math, if suddenly other digits pop up, those are no longer reflective of the overall measurement. So let's say we were doing, we were using this volume or this volume of 644 milliliters in some calculation. Um, if we did the calculation and we came out with something like, uh, I don't know, 50.648 joules, that is assuming that we took a more precise measurement than we actually did. And so that's why it's important to always keep track of your significant figures and carry them forward. Otherwise, you're effectively telling someone that you were more exact about something than you actually were when you're reporting your final number. So this is why that, that kind of thing is important. All right, and a measurement will always have uncertainty. When you use a, a balance upstairs, you know, the analytical balances has a nice readout, five significant figures, you know, 4.3248. That's still not exact. That last digit, that eight, is uncertain. All right? You're not estimating it. The balance is estimating it, but it is uncertain. It's significant, but it's uncertain. Um, and so if it's wavering a little bit in that last digit, that's, that's OK. All right. Yeah, we talked about this, plus or minus one. OK, so let's talk about these words precision and accuracy. Which one do you think fits in which box here? I'm going to turn the lights back. Is that okay or do you want me to turn the lights off? Uh, off? Yeah. Is that too dark? Okay. What's the top one? The agreement of a given value to the true value. Is that precision or is that accuracy? What do you say? That is accuracy. If something is accurate, it is very close to, we could say, correct. So then the degree, the, what precision means is the degree of agreement. And in life, and even in this class, we kind of use those interchangeably sometimes because we really want both. But it's important to note that they really um, describe slightly different things. So here's a set of three measurements. Let's say some students were weighing some stuff out. And the first student uh, got these values, kind of a, a pretty big range. Second student got these. Third student got these. And the actual mass of the thing that they were measuring is 10, 10.0 right, gram. So what would we say about student A? Is, are student A's measurements accurate? <coughs> Actually, they are. They're fairly accurate because the average of student A's measurements is 10.13, which is pretty close to 10. So this is somewhat accurate, but it's not precise because the measurements kind of go all over the place. So they average out to the right thing, but they kind of go all over the place. So we might say this one is accurate or somewhat accurate, but not precise. If you have accuracy but not precision in a measurement, that tells you that the, that the measurement has a lot of random error in it. You know, stuff is randomly happening that seems to be changing the value. Maybe there's um, wind blowing through the classroom, but the Currents are always changing, and so it's affecting the balance a little bit. But it's always affecting it in different ways. And this is actually not a big deal, because all this really tells you, if you, have, um, if you don't have the precision, is that if you do have a lot of random error, I'm sorry, what that really tells you is that you just need to do a lot of measurements. And if you do a lot of measurements, all the random errors cancel out, and you get the, the correct value. All right, let's look at student B. What's going on there? Yeah, there's, there's good precision, but the accuracy is not there. It's, it's off. So this person is getting really good repeatable measurements, but it's not right. Um, so this one, we might say, is precise, but not accurate. And this is indicative of a systematic error. That means something is always wrong with this person's measurement. Maybe they're always, maybe it's a, tall person who 
doesn't want to look down to the level of the graduated cylinder properly, so they're always kind of looking at it down from an angle. And so they're always getting it a little bit wrong, and it's always a little bit low or whatever it is. Um, these are the things you really have to watch out for, because you're doing your measurements, and your measurements look good because they look the same over and over again, and you think, all right, well, good, yeah, we got it. But then as it turns out, you looked at the same thing over and over again, but it's the same wrong thing over and over again. So you always have to ask yourself, uh, and it's, it's really difficult, but you always have to think about what might I be doing wrong that I'm doing wrong every single time, and, and is there any way I can fix that, or is there anything I can do about that? Okay, so then student C, of course, is both precise and accurate, and that's what we strive for. And a lot of this is just a, a function of the measurement itself. Um, it's not always just being careless or what, what people call human error. Sometimes there are just things that work better than others in, in various ways or certain effects of whatever you're doing that set one thing off. It's just how it goes. All right. So significant figures. I, I, um, We'll talk about this a little bit. I know you've, you've done this before, and, and I'm going to assume that you've had some experience with this before. But let's just look at a couple examples. How many significant figures are in that value? Four. What about this one? Just one. Just one. Um, what about this one? I'm going to describe. I'm going to talk about this in a second, but I just want to throw some out there. Actually, technically, there's just one significant figure here, and then what about this one? This one has four. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. And this is something you definitely want to uh, go back and review in the book. Um, take a look at these rules. So generally, you count all digits as significant that are non-zero. Right? Anything not zero is significant. And any zeros that are sandwiched between non-zero things are also significant. All right. So like the one and the six and the first one are significant, and then the zeros are significant because they're in between, so we count all those as four. All right, now the, the little bit tricky ones, or the ones where it gets a little bit weird, are these middle two. We got all those zeros, why don't they count? And, and yeah, why don't those zeros count? Thinking about what we just did with measurement, why don't those zeros count? Why aren't they significant? It's true, they're not sandwiched between two numbers, but from like a theoretical standpoint, or from an explanation, now that you know that significant figures have something to do with measurement, why is it that we can't count those zeros? They're what? Uh, well, yeah, scientific notation might be a better way to express that so we're not confusing ourselves, but what is it about a measurement? Like, okay, so let's say you did some measurement and it came out to point zero 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 two. Why is only the two significant in that measurement? Um, yeah, I think that's getting there. The, the zeros in the middle two examples here only give you a sense of scale. So the three zeros before the two in the first one tell you that this is a measurement of a very small thing. But that doesn't really tell you that the measurement itself is any more um, precise or, or uh, yeah, any more precise than it would be otherwise. So let's say... Um, Let's, okay, let me look at this. So let's say that we, we have this measurement of 0 0.002. What this really means is that we've taken a measurement between 0, 0, 0,001 and 0, 0, 0, 0,003, right? Because that last digit is uncertain. And then the second one, what that says really is that we took a measurement that was between 9 million and 11 million. So the range in digits is still plus or minus one, 
the zeros only tell us if this is something large that we're measuring or something small that we're measuring. It doesn't tell us uh, a degree of accuracy or precision, a degree of precision that would be shown by more significant figures. So somebody mentioned scientific notation. I think that's a good point here, that if we express these in scientific notation, this one is going to be 2 times 10 to the negative uh, 4. And this one is 1 times 10 to the 7th. Right. So that 10 to the number, that again tells us a magnitude. It tells us if we're in a big range or a small range. But it's not significant. The 1 and the 2 are significant. And so that's why we often express numbers like this in scientific notation, so it's not confusing how many significant figures we have. If all of these zeros in 10 million were significant, what that means is that we made a measurement that was between uh, 9,999,999 and 10 million and 1, which is a much more um, precise measurement than being between 9 million and 11 million. So let's look now at this last one and talk about that a little bit more. 100.0, there are four significant figures. Why is the zero after the decimal <coughs> place more important than all these other zeros in the middle ones? Why does that zero get to be significant and these others don't? It's trailing after the decimal. It is, but what, what's important about that that makes it significant? It shows yeah, it shows a different level of uh, precision. 100.0 means that we're between 99.9 .9 and 100.1, right? Because it's about plus or minus 1 on the last significant figure. So what if we said 100 instead? L let's say 100 dot, which is a way that we, tell, that we say that uh, all those numbers are significant. We put a decimal place there. So if all those numbers are significant, then what we're saying is that this is between 99 and 101. All right. And what if we didn't have those that significant? We just had the one significant figure. Well, now we're saying that this is between 90 and 110. Wait, no. No, we're saying this is between 0 and 200, actually. Right? Because the 1 is significant. So it either goes to 0 or it goes to 2. So these, look, look at these three. Those are greatly different in terms of precision, right? To say that something is between 99.9 .9 and 100.1 is a lot different from saying that something is between 0 and 200. So when a 0 changes the precision of your measurement or changes the range in which your measurement is correct, then it becomes significant. And that's why trailing zeros or zeros at the ends after decimal places are significant because they affect actually that, um, that number. I mean, if you imagine measuring or measuring some tolerances of something, um, say, uh, reporting something as 100.0 is a lot different from reporting something as 100 when it comes to cutting that piece or, or whatever, the, the precision required. OK. So now when we combine the significant figures together, um, let's review this, because this is something that I know um, tends to disappear from our heads if we don't use it all the time. Multiplication and division, I think this is actually the easy one. Um, all you got to do is remember that the result carries the same number of significant figures as the one with the fewest. So I'm going to give you some numbers to multiply here. We talked about this a little bit on Monday, too. So 1.052 times 12.054 times 0 0.53. And I punch that all into my calculator, and I get something like 6.7208. How should I report that number? Well, let's look at it. Let's count the significant figures. How many significant in here? There's four significant there. Five significant here. And only these two are significant because remember that zero in front only tells us about the magnitude. It's not, a, it's not a significant figure. So that means that this whole thing, this whole calculation, is limited 
to that least precise measurement. So we should report that as 6.7. And the reason this is important, as we've just been talking about, it's not like this is a game and you know we just have to remember that it's two and, and for some weird reason people have decided that. It has real basis in measurement. Because if you, if you made a measurement that was imprecise or less precise than your other measurements, that's what controls your overall thing. That's what controls your overall precision, is your least precise measurement. So if your least precise measurement has two significant figures, it doesn't matter if your other ones were more precise. That limits the overall precision of your answer. So when you combine all these numbers together, uh, that's your limiting factor. And then with addition and subtraction, it's a little bit different because in this case, um, well, if you think about the numerical manipulation here, that precision can carry through the addition. So I'll, I'll give you some more numbers to look at. And I'm going to put them on top of each other like in, in kind of a different way than you're maybe used to adding. So 2.345, 0.0, .0 6.7. Two point nine nine seven five. All right, so we line up all the decimal places, and we get five point four one two five. Now, if these were multiplied, we would say that the smallest number of significant figures is one, so our answer should have one significant figure. But when we're adding, it goes by decimal place instead because adding and subtracting doesn't change the number of decimals in your answer like multiplying and dividing does. So what we do is kind of draw a line. You don't have to do it this way. You can just remember that it goes by the smallest number of decimal places. But we see that the smallest decimal place here is the 7 in the uh, hundredths place. So that means that our answer should be reported to the hundredths place as well. Because what that's saying is our, our least precise measurement measured out to a hundredth, the plus or minus one hundredth. So our answer can also be plus or minus one hundredth. All right. And let's do some, uh, one more rule, and then we'll talk about, uh, and then we'll do some examples. So rounding, we, again, we all know about rounding. We've done it since we were little. But we need to make sure we're all rounding the same way. So in science, if a value is less than 5, the preceding digit stays the same. So if it's 15.22 and you only want three significant figures, that means that, actually, that's a bad example. Um, sorry, I meant to say if we want one significant figure, then we round this to 1, all right? Think about that rule. Whoops. Two. I'm sorry, I was on part B. I'm losing it. Let's do this all the way out. Let's say this would round to 15.2, or depending on how many figures we need, 15 or 2. If the digit to be removed is greater than equal to or greater than 5, the preceding digit is increased by 1. So 121.45 rounds to 121.2. Five or one twenty one or twelve or, or one twenty, depending. Yeah. Uh, twenty or two. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. You're right. Twenty. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. No, fifteen doesn't round. Right. Doesn't round to two. I was just looking at the digit. Um, but the key here is only look at the digit next to the one you're rounding. All right, this one um, can sometimes, well, that's, that's fine. Just look at the digit that you're rounding. All right, so now we've got all the rules. Let's do some practice. Yesterday. How many miles would you walk if you had to walk 10.0 kilometers? So you need to know these various conversions. And the other thing you need to know 
is how the significant figures work in these conversions. So let's see, we've got 10.0 kilometers, right? Which means our final answer in miles, we want to also have three significant figures. Now we, so, so we can use factors that have more than that, but we certainly don't want to use factors that have less, or we've ruined our precision from the, from the beginning. So this, these are some things you need to know. See if everybody can set this thing up. If you have a calculator, go through and, and calculate it. Otherwise, uh, just set it up, and we'll do it together in a minute. So you can do this all in one big line if you like, or you can set it up in individual problems going from unit to unit. So 10.0 kilometers. First, we're going to convert kilometers to meters. So we're going to say 1,000 meters per one kilometer. That'll give us meters. Then 100 centimeters in a meter. That gives us centimeters. Then 1 inch in 2.54 centimeters. And then um, what are we doing here? Uh, inches to feet, right? So 12 inches and in one foot. And I'm just going to continue this on here. So that cancels. We've canceled centimeters. We've canceled inches. So now we need to cancel feet. It's 5,280 feet in one mile. And so now we have miles, right? So if you uh, punch that all out, what do you get? So give me a bunch of numbers. OK, so let's say that came out this many miles. How do we report that based on significant figures? Right, so this should be 6.21 because that's what we started with, and that's the smallest um, precision that we have through our conversion as well. Yeah? What if we were to use like different um, conversion methods and get like different answers? Uh, well, if you got a different answer, then don't use that conversion method. Um, but if you use a different one, you got the same answer, that's fine. What, what, what happened? Well, because I used 1.609 kilometers per mile. Um, yeah, what did you, so what did you come up with? 6.22. Yeah. So again, that, that works, right? Because 6.21, that last digit being uncertain, 6.22, last digit being uncertain, that's still OK. So that's fine. You didn't use, I'm sorry, I thought you meant, you use the same method, you just use a different number, right? Yeah, a different conversion, make it easier. Yeah. Yeah, in general, with a couple exceptions that I, that might come up, uh, I don't think so actually. I'll give you any of these unusual numbers that you need. If you know other ones, that's always good too. Um, the only ones that you really need to know in your head all the time are uh, the conversions of the metric system. So you need to know how many meters in a kilometer, how many centimeters in a meter. That kind of stuff. So review that if that's something that you don't know. All right. Other questions about that? Think you're good with unit conversions and significant figures? OK. We will have a quiz on this stuff on Monday. All right. So begin a class on Monday, first quiz. On um, whatever. I got a question. Yeah. Well, is it? Well, no, no, no. You're right that you have to look at the whole conversion. Yeah, but 12 inches in a foot is a, is an exact definition. So you can report this as 12 inches. This could be 12.000. You can have as many zeros as you want there because there are exactly 12 inches in one foot. These other two, 
are, you have to worry about those numbers of significant figures because they're not exact. It's 2.541 something something uh, centimeters in an inch. Yeah. So anytime it's a definition, it's like this, there's exactly this many of this in one of these, then uh, you don't worry about the significant figures. I did. Oh, good, good point. <laughs> Wednesday. We'll do a Wednesday. So you have a nice long weekend to work on this. Um, generally, quizzes, as I said on Monday, will be kind of just the beginning. So you'll come in, do the quiz, uh, 9.30, 10, 15 minutes, turn in, we'll be done. It's just on computer. It'll be on whatever we finish today. Okay. Anything we do today. Yeah, you know, through today. And bring your calculators. Uh, when we're upstairs, there's a nice set of classroom calculators. But down here, there isn't. So please remember to bring a calculator. Um, you really, I, I'm not going to let you use phones and stuff on quizzes because you can look stuff up on there. But please bring calculator on Monday. If you know that you can't bring a calculator because yours is broken or you don't have one or whatever, send me an email and I'll bring one down from upstairs for you. But try to bring one if you've got them. Um, I think you can buy calculators at the store also. I'm, I think some stores have them. I might be wrong. All right, temperature. There's this whole derivation of how you convert temperature stuff. Uh, I don't think it's really necessary to go through that. The point is you have to be able to do this. You have to be able to convert temperature. And it's not as simple as just knowing um, a unit factor because the measurements are a little bit different. So first we're going to talk about uh, Kelvin and Celsius. I'm sure you've heard of those before. What's the difference between Kelvin and Celsius? I mean, why, why are they different? How are they developed? What are they for? Kelvin we use only in science. Celsius means Yeah. Although, uh, people who grew up in, in the U.S. say that Celsius is only used in science, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> we use it all over the world. Yes, yeah, I know. But, so what's the difference between Kelvin and Celsius? Why, why are there two scales? Yeah. Kelvin represented for higher temperatures. Uh, Kelvin's represented for higher temperatures? Um, maybe, yeah, like when you talk, look at temperatures in space and stuff, that's usually reported in Kelvin, but that might be an issue of the science thing, too. What, um, let's think about isn't the extremes. Isn't particles moving? Isn't zero Kelvin exactly like negative 273 degrees Celsius because it's, it's isn't it to what the particles are moving? It's yes. In an energy exchange? Yes, so zero Kelvin is absolute zero, which means it is the lowest temperature you can possibly have, meaning that all atomic motion has stopped. Atoms have stopped moving. You, um, uh, we'll talk about this later in the semester, but temperature is really a measure of kinetic energy, of the energy of atoms. And so if the, energy, if the atoms have stopped moving, they cease to have any kinetic energy, so that there is no temperature anymore, so temperature is zero. So Kelvin uh, zero is zero. There is no lower temperature than zero K, zero Kelvins. Uh, zero Celsius is what? The freezing point of water, right? So Celsius is a more uh, useful temperature in normal realms because you know we, we know water freezes at a reasonable temperature and it's that way outside you can be a little below that you can be above that some more you know you get smaller numbers Kelvin water freezes at 273.15 degrees <coughs> or what 273.15 Kelvins so that would be a little bit clunky if we're using that in everyday life and that's why it usually only comes up in science because otherwise you've got these big numbers to deal with all the time. So that said, Kelvin and Celsius have the same size unit. One Kelvin is the same size as one degree Celsius. And notice the different way that I said that. This isn't that important, but a Kelvin is a unit, like a centimeter or a meter, whereas a Celsius is a degree. So we say degrees Celsius, but we don't say degrees Kelvin. We say Kelvin or Kelvins. It's, it's not that important, but you'll notice that, that Kelvins are reported as just K, whereas Celsius and, and Fahrenheit are degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit. So anyway, one Kelvin and one degree Celsius are the same size, which means it's the same 
gradation of the scale, which means to convert them, we just need to add or subtract. So a Kelvin is degrees Celsius plus 273.15, um, and a Celsius is a Kelvin minus 273.15. Or the temperature, not a, uh, the temperature in each. You need to know that factor. Okay. You have to know that number. At least the 273 part. But you have to be able to do that conversion. OK. So Fahrenheit and Celsius becomes a little bit trickier because look at these different ranges. Boiling point of water in Fahrenheit is 212, Celsius is 100. Freezing point of water in Fahrenheit is 32, freezing point of water in Celsius is 0. So you've got 0 to 100, which is 100 degrees, versus 32 to 212, which is 180 degrees. So that means that a degree Fahrenheit is smaller than a degree Celsius. Right? Okay. So that means that the conversion becomes a little bit trickier because we have to convert the size of the degree as well as the, um, the, the offset of the scale. So here are two equations that you need to know. All right, you need to know that the temperature in Celsius is 5 ninths times the temperature in Fahrenheit minus 32. The temperature in Fahrenheit is 9 over 5 times the temperature in Celsius total plus 32. So we're going to do some examples here because I want to make sure that you understand the parentheses. Another way we could write this So that temperature is in the parentheses, which means when you go from Fahrenheit to Celsius, you subtract first. This one is outside the parentheses. Which means you multiply first and then add 32. Okay, It's important to keep track of those orders. All right, normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees F. What is this temperature expressed in Kelvin? So to do that, which equation are we going to use, the left one or the right one to start? We're going to use the one on the left to get it to Celsius, and then we're going to convert Celsius to Kelvin um, by subtracting 273. Or, I'm sorry, adding 273. Anybody get this one? I don't have a. Calculate it with me. What? Three. Ten point oh five. Okay. And um, how many significant figures should we report there? Three. Yeah, that thirty-two is an exact difference. So. Um, or this is subtraction, so it doesn't affect it. So this should be really 310. 310.15? Right. Well, either way, that's going to drop with the, um, with the rounding. But we could say this is, so this is 310 degrees C. Yep. Yeah, there are a couple of different equations. No, whatever works. Um, the other way to is um, you're talking about subtracting and dividing by 1.8. Yeah, divide by 1.8. Yeah. Well, we're not done yet. Yes, we're not done yet. Oh, this is the Kelvin temperature. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. 
I was going to say, that would be a pretty hot person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it should be 37 point something. It's what? It's exactly 37. So 37.0? Okay. Degrees C. And then that's going to be 310 Kelvin. Alright, so then try this one also going the other way. Outer space is about 4 Kelvin. What is this temperature expressed in degrees Fahrenheit? Alright. And how should we express that with uh, significant figures? How do we express that with significant figures? Would it be the same? Actually, you know what? We, we did something wrong here with significant figures in the previous one, too. Anybody know what it is? Is that right? I, I just got that from somebody. Yeah, 452, right? 0.2. Yeah, let's go through it. So we would have uh, 4 Kelvin minus 273.15 equals whatever that is, degree C. Um, like that, right? Okay, then we'd plug that into the uh, second equation above. So we'd say the Fahrenheit temperature is 9 fifths times negative 269.15 degrees C plus 32. And that, I believe, should come out to minus 452.47, is that, or point something? Yeah. And if our measurement is really just 4 Kelvin, then we should really report this as minus 500 degrees F, one significant figure. But often when we're doing these kind of problems, to, to, so if we're trying to learn something different, I'll be a little bit relaxed on significant figures. Where it really becomes important is when we're doing stuff in lab. But it's clear that you took these measurements to these, this level of precision, and you have to follow that through with the various um, calculations. When it comes to exams and stuff, I, I don't really care. Other than maybe the quiz on Monday, because we just talked about this stuff, it's not going to be a big deal. Oh, no, we've gotten, like, like, si like. I know they haven't gotten. No, no, but within like many decimal places of it, like point zero 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 one, that kind of range. Okay, so uh, let's quick recap before we go on. Make sure that you can do unit conversions, find significant figures, take appropriate measurements, right, with appropriate significant figures, and convert temperatures. That's what we got so far. Okay, good. Next topic, density. What is density? How would you define density? Mass over volume, yeah. That's the um, equation would be mass volume. If you were to describe to someone in words who didn't know math, how would you describe what density means? Yeah. Yeah, right. Did everybody hear that? Yeah. It's the amount of mass in some given amount of space.
So the given amount of space is the volume and then the mass. So it's mass per volume. And then what's the common um, unit for density? Grams per milliliter, or grams per cubic centimeter. You can, just, you can express density in any kind of units you want, any kind of mass and any kind of volume. But commonly, it's expressed in grams per milliliter. Why is that? Anybody know? There's a, there's a sort of a simple standard density. Water. Yeah, yeah water at a specific temperature is 1. It has a density of 1. Uh, it changes a little bit with temperature, which you'll see on, in lab tomorrow. So one thing we want to do is be able to measure. Uh, one thing we, we use density for is to convert between mass and volume. And when I say convert, obviously they're different units. But we can measure things, specifically liquids, by weighing them. Right? You can dump some water on a balance and weigh it. You can also measure liquid by measuring a certain amount of volume. But to understand that you have the same amount, you need to use the density to go back and forth. So here's an example. If we have 10 mLs of ethylene glycol, which is the main component of antifreeze, what is the mass? And to figure that out, we use the density. Right? So how are we going to set up this equation? We know we have 10 mLs of ethylene glycol, and our density is 1.1132 grams per cubic centimeter. What do we do with those numbers? We're going to multiply them. One milliliter, remember, equals one cubic centimeter. So that means that we can say 10 mLs times 1.132 grams per cubic centimeter or grams per milliliter is about 11.1 grams. Let's say this was 10.0 milliliters. Okay. Has anybody ever tested your uh, cooling fluid in your car with a little thingy with a little bubble in it? Yeah, that's basically a measurement of density. You've got a little ball with a certain amount of, of density, and you're seeing how much ethylene glycol to water ratio is in there, really, to see if it still has the appropriate properties or if it's broken down. We can do more complicated um, problems with density as well. This is a problem from your book, um, from, from chapter one. Liquid nitrogen has a density of 0.808 grams per milliliter. Okay, so that's a fairly low density. And boils at 77K. Researchers purchased liquid nitrogen in insulated 175 liter tanks. And you'll see one of these upstairs um, probably in a couple weeks. It's this giant, big metal thing. The liquid vaporizes quickly, gaseous nitrogen. Has anybody ever seen liquid nitrogen become gaseous nitrogen? Just kind of right, happens right away. And gaseous nitrogen, look at the density of that 1.15 grams per liter at standard temperature and pressure. So grams per liter now instead of grams per milliliter. Obviously, a gas is going to be much less dense than, than a liquid. So let's say that all the liquid nitrogen accidentally vaporizes. The thing, the, the tank fails, and the liquid nitrogen all comes out and vaporizes. And our room is 10 meters by 10 meters by 2.5 meters. So it's kind of like a closet, I guess, Yeah, um, with a really high ceiling. That's a weird shaped room, actually. <laughs> or no, I guess that's about. Two and a half meters is, is about the ceiling height, probably, right? So it's not a cloud. So it's a 10 meter by 10 meter room. So that's actually probably reasonably close to the size of this room. I was thinking uh, feet. What is the maximum fraction of the air in the room that could be displaced by the gaseous nitrogen? So this, this question is getting a little bit trickier now. We have to use a lot of different things put together to figure this out. First of all, let's just ask what Whenever you see big problems like this, the first place to start is what is the thing asking? We're asking, or they're asking, what is the maximum fraction of the air in the room that could be displaced by gaseous nitrogen? 
So what, is, what do you think you need to know to solve this problem? What do we need to figure out based on reading that sentence? One, I mean, there's a few things, but what's one of them? Well, we're going to know the fraction. We want to know the fraction of the air displaced. So first, we kind of need to know how much air there was in the room to start with, right? So let's do that first, and then we'll go back. How much? How do we figure out how much air is in the room? Volume of the room, right? So how do you figure that out? Right. So we've got. 10 meters by 10 meters by 2.5 meters equals uh, 250, all right? And that's cubic meters. All right. So what's the other thing we need to know? Just in general, like, what's the other part of this answer? If we know the, the amount of air in the room, what do we need to know about the nitrogen? Yeah, we know how much we need to know how much nitrogen is there, because that's what that last that's what the question is really asking us. You got this much air in the room. You got the, how much nitrogen are you going to get, so that it gets like how much air is going to come out or is going to be dis displaced by that nitrogen. So we have to figure out how much nitrogen is coming out of that tank. To figure that out, we have to know how much is in the tank, right? And that we know. We're assuming it's full. It's a 175 liter tank. And its density as a liquid in the tank is 0 0.808 grams per milliliter. Okay? So we can say 175 liters, if you if you mind if I do a quick conversion in my head here, and say that's really 175,000 milliliters, right? Times 0 0.808 grams per milliliter. And that's and that's grams of nitrogen. With these big problems, it's really important to keep track of all your units so that you don't get confused with what wait, what was this number and what was this number and whatever. Um, so we've got 141,400 grams of nitrogen in the tank. And all of, that, all of that nitrogen is going to come out into the room. All right. So we need to know um, how many, we need to know how much, it, how much space it takes up when it comes out of the tank. And to do that, we're going to use the other density that's here, the density of the gaseous nitrogen. So we use the density of the liquid nitrogen to figure out how much was in the tank. Now we're going to use the density of the gaseous nitrogen to figure out how much there is in the room when it all comes out. So what do we do? How do we do that? Right, we're going to take this number. And we're going to multiply it by this new density, 1.15 <coughs> 1. grams per liter. The grams cancel. Oh, yep, you're right. Thank you. Should have, should have taken a shortcut. And divide it here, grams per one liter. So we divide that, and you get that this is going to take up 122,956 liters of nitrogen. So that's how much gaseous nitrogen is going to exist in the room 
uh, if we do this. Okay, so we're close now, but we've got some wrong units, right? Because we've got this in cubic meters, and we've got this in liters. And a liter is not equal to a cubic meter. So how do you want to fix that? Does anybody know the conversion between liters and cubic meters? Well, we know one milliliter is one cubic centimeter, yeah. One liter is a thousand milliliters. So yeah, n not knowing this conversion exactly in our heads, we need to go through milliliters, right? So let's do that just to make it easier. So one, to convert that to milliliters means we multiply by a thousand, right? So that's going to give us, let's change this to a uh, scientific notation here. That's going to give us 1.23 times 10 to the eighth believe, wait, right, as well. yeah, milliliters of nitrogen. Because this is 1.23 times 10 to the fifth, and if we multiply by 1,000, we add 3 to that exponent, so it's going to be times 10 to the eighth. And so, question? Uh, if you count from here, one, two, three, four, five. Ten to the sixth would be a million. Right? If what you're saying though is what you're forgetting is you multiply by a thousand for milliliters to get ten to the eighth. That's what she's missing. Yes, you multiply by a thousand. So ten to the fifth times a thousand is ten to the eighth. Right? 10 to the 10 to the fifth times 10 to the third, which is a thousand, mm -hmm. equals 10 to the eighth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thanks for checking that. I, sometimes I make shortcuts, and I want to make sure that people are with me. So please stop me if you ever feel like I'm not being clear. Also, there's as you've seen, there's a good chance I'm just wrong about stuff. So. It's always good to ask. OK, um, so let's convert this room business then. How many, uh, do we want to do cubic centimeters in a cubic meter? <coughs> or I think it would be clearer if we just redo this multiplication in centimeters. Is that all right? So let's convert each of these to centimeters by multiplying by 100. So that's going to be 1,000 centimeters times 1,000 centimeters times 250 centimeters. And that's uh, 2.50 times 10 to the eighth cubic centimeters. And now we've got our numbers. So we've got 1.23 times 10 to the eighth milliliters of the nitrogen. We've got 2.5 times 10 to the eighth centimeters, uh, cubic centimeters of, in the room. So how much of the air in the room is the nitrogen displacing? About half, right? Yeah, it's about half. Because the amount of nitrogen is about half the size of the amount of the room. So officially answering this question, the maximum fraction of air in the room would be 1.23 times 10 to the eighth divided by 2.50 times 10 to the eighth, which is right about 0.5. I don't know the exact number there. So you think that's enough to get you in trouble, breathing-wise? Yeah, probably. Um, so we have to be kind of careful with those things. When they're stored in labs, it's not really a big deal because the labs upstairs turn over the air so fast that it'll clear it right out of there. But that's why um, like it's very dangerous to take those sorts of things, to, to transport those sorts of things in elevators because you could get stuck in the elevator with this thing that then, you know, so, so there are a lot of important safety considerations for dealing with these. 
All right, that was a big problem. But these are the sorts of things you want to work up to in your book. You'll see more like this. Uh, I think the book does a reasonably good job of kind of building you up into those problems, doing some easier ones and then kind of going. But I want to show you what like a uh, um, exam question type thing might look like. And Akash will help you with these at these at your sessions too. Have you taken a look at the schedules and stuff yet? No, they're still working on it right now. Okay. Thanks. All right, we got about 10 minutes left. Um, just a few more definitions to talk about so we can all be talking about the same thing. And then I think you should be good with the f pretty much with the first chapter here. So uh, you've probably heard this before. There's solids, there's liquids, there's gases. Has anybody not heard of one of those three before? I hope not. OK, good. Um, but again, as we did with the other stuff, it's stuff you've heard before, but now stuff that we want to be a little bit more specific on our definitions. So a solid has a fixed volume and shape. A liquid has a fixed volume, but no fixed shape. It takes the shape of its container. And a gas has no fixed volume or shape. It takes on the shape and the volume of its container. You think about what that means, it kind of makes sense intuitively. You put liquid in a glass, it takes on the shape of its container, but it keeps the same volume. You put gas in a flask, it takes on the shape and the volume of the container. So that's really what separates those. And we'll also see some examples where these lines are a little bit blurred. And something is kind of has properties of one, but also properties of the other. All right. And mostly what we're going to be dealing with, again, I'm not going to go through everything here. You can read this. Mostly what we're going to be dealing with is mixtures. And there are two important words that you need to know about mixtures. And they are homogeneous and heterogeneous. Those are words you may have heard before. We're going to use them a lot. And they're really pretty simple categories. A homogeneous mixture has visibly indistinguishable parts, meaning it looks the same throughout. A heterogeneous mixture does not look the same throughout. Okay. And remember, visible is the key here. So something can be a mixture of different things, but you can't, but it looks kind of the same. Um, and we're going to look at some examples of that, and that's considered homogeneous. So let me jump down a couple pages here. Eventually, we're going to talk about all of these things, but look just over on the right here at the mixtures. So if something is a mixture, you ask yourself, does it look uniform throughout? Is it, does it have distinguishable parts or indistinguishable? The example they give is wet sand is clearly a heterogeneous mixture. It's got water. It's got different parts of sand that look different. There's definitely different things going on there. Um, but something like tea with sugar in it is still a mixture. It's got all the different molecules from the tea. It's got the sugar molecules. But when you look at a glass of tea, it looks the same throughout. So that's homogeneous. Looks the same throughout. And that's all. That's all there really is to that. Okay. The other side of this then are the pure substances. So we got mixtures on one side. Let's look at this again. You got matter, which is everything, right? And then you've got mixtures on one side and pure substances on the other side. A mixture has a variable composition. It has different parts in it, and pure substances do not have a variable composition. So we talked about the two mixtures. Now let's talk about the two pure substances. They can be an element or a compound. A compound can be broken down into its elements, but only by chemical processes. So examples of compounds are things like molecules. A water molecule is a compound because it's made up of hydrogen and oxygen atoms. But you can't break water down into hydrogen and oxygen atoms without doing a chemical reaction. So a compound can't be broken down except by chemical reaction, whereas a mixture can be broken down by <laughs> physical means, by melting, by distillation, by physical separation of parts, that sort of thing. And then elements cannot be decomposed by chemical or physical means. So you can do whatever chemistry you want in an element. You're not going to break it down into smaller parts. That's the realm of nuclear um, reactions. And those are, of course, the elements uh, in the periodic table. So here's a nice summary of that stuff.
let's look at the pure substances now. So can you separate the pure substance into simpler, smaller substances, generally elements? In the case of something like hydrogen or helium, you can't. It's just helium, it's going to be helium. doesn't matter what kind of chemistry you do on it. You're not going to make it anything smaller than helium. Water is a compound. It's not an element. It's made up of elements. It's not a mixture because it's a pure substance. It's all water. Um, but it can be broken down through chemical reactions into hydrogen and oxygen. And then we talked about the mixtures. So one way that you need um, to be able to think about these is to talk about how they change, or how they can change. So let's talk briefly about this. You've probably heard these words before. Physical changes, chemical changes. When something undergoes a physical change, it does not change its um, com chemical composition. So when dry ice becomes CO2 gas, it's still CO2. The molecules have separated from each other, but you haven't changed the chemistry of what's going on in there. Same thing with sugar dissolving in water. You put sugar in water, it's still sugar molecules, it's still water molecules, they just happen to be a mixture now, a homogeneous mixture. Right. Something burning, though, is a chemical change, because you've converted something like propane to carbon dioxide in water. So you've changed the chemical makeup. And these pictures kind of show that, that these molecules that went in become different molecules coming out. And that shows you that it's a chemical change. So you need to be able to um, determine whether things are mixtures or pure substances, elements, compounds, homogeneous, heterogeneous. And you should be able to determine um, which is which. So I'm trying to find an example here before we go. All right, so take a look at, there's a bunch of weird questions here. Take a look at this bottom one, just because I could hide the answer. Choose the heterogeneous mixture from the list below. Which of those three, which of those five would you call a heterogeneous mixture? Everybody think of one, don't yell it out yet. Go through them, think about it. All right, who says A, B, C, D? Yeah, there you go, right? There's chicken, there's noodles, all kinds of good stuff. Now I'm hungry. All right, which one of these is an element? Carbon. Carbon. Which one of them is a compound? Hmm. B, chlorine gas is the compound. It is Cl2. There's a molecule of CO2, Cl2. So it's technically an element also. Um, and then what would you, how would you best classify A and C, the sports drink and the black coffee? Those are homogeneous mixtures. They're made up of lots of different molecules, but they look the same throughout. All right? Great. All right. So tomorrow.